Sue Canterbury joined the Dallas Museum of Art in September 2011 and has acted as curator of the nationally touring exhibitions Youth and Beauty, Art of the American Twenties in 2012 and Hopper Drawing, A Painter's Process in 2013-2014. In addition, she has presented Lauren Mosley, Structural Integrity in uh, 2013 and Alexander Hogue, The Erosion Series in 2014. So she's been busy since she got here. The first in-depth consideration of this important group of paintings featuring the ecological disaster of the American Dust Bowl. Currently, she's developing Ida O'Keefe, Escaping Georgia's Shadow, an exhibition plan for 2017 on Georgia's younger sister. Prior to her appointment in Dallas, Canterbury was the Associate Curator of Paintings at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, where she curated several key exhibitions, including Noble Dreams and Simple Pleasures, American Masterworks from Minnesota Collections, and Beaufort Delaney from New York to Paris. Prior to her appointment in Minneapolis, she worked as an assistant curator at the Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute in Williamston, Williamstown, Massachusetts. She earned her master's from the graduate program in the history of art from Williams College in Williamstown. I hope that's Williamstown, Williamstown. Uh, where she also was awarded the Judith M. Lennett Fellowship. She received her undergraduate degree in art history from Wellesley College, where she was awarded the Proctor Prize in Art History and inducted into Phi Beta Kappa. So please join me in welcoming Sue Camber. Thanks, Tam, for that, that great introduction. Um, a little long one, but um, sort of. Uh, but I'm, I'm really glad to be here to speak this morning, and I'm really surprised to see so many of you here. I thought you might have washed up in the bayou by now. Uh, and for those who didn't, you would probably, uh, you're not a morning person like me. Uh, so those of those who aren't a morning person, could you raise your hand? Uh, okay, now I know who to look out for. It. Uh, I'll keep you awake uh, as much as possible, or you can help keep me awake. Um, but it's a, a good subject to bring forward to let you know what's going on at the DMA. And because um, we do have a, a really great tradition, we are in a fortunate position when it comes to holdings of Texas art. And could we have a lights down, please? A little bit. Um, Images will just look better for everyone. Um, but we are in a really enviable position, um, and it stems from several factors, as many of you know. Uh, and it begins with the fledgling Dallas Art Association. Our first acquisitions in 1904 were two underdogs, one by Julian and one by Robert, and then our really actually very first purchase in 1907, which was Frank Ray's Driving the Herd. And of course, there was the inauguration of the early purchase prizes in 1935, which essentially allowed the uh, DMA to skim off the cream of the crop from the competitive exhibitions every year uh, to uh, pull into the permanent collection. But of course, I think if there were anything that, um, a factor that anyone could uh, credit more than anything else. Okay, so I think the main factor in the whole success and the legacy of Texas art at the DMA is really Jerry Bywaters. I, he can be credit, credited basically for nurturing the seed of Texas art, uh, the Dallas Nine in particular, and Texas art in general. And his vision was of an institution that would really celebrate the art of the region rather than following East Coast models um, for Dallas. Neither Dallas nor Texas really needed a mini metropolitan, in Bywater's opinion. His stance and his close connection to his fellow artists uh, led to a flowering of the arts in Dallas. And he built uh, a legacy and he nurtured it. Uh, the flowering of the art and the foundation he built is a legacy that continues to give energy to the museum and its many visitors today. The legacy is one that demands our attention on several levels, and that includes the preservation of the objects that are already with us in the collection, and also educating the public through our installations in the permanent collection galleries, as well as um, in exhibitions, how we essentially delve more deeply and research on, into these individual works, but also place them within the context of their time. And finally, the enhancement of the collection through acquisitions. So I'd like to share with you from this point several of the things that we've been doing at the DMA in those, um, within that framework of preservation and sharing 
and also uh, expanding the legacy forward. And here we are, conservation projects in particular, uh, well, moving forward quickly there. But we were fortunate in 2013 to open our own conservation lab at the DMA. Uh, prior to that, it was basically we were farming things out like many of you go to a conservator and have them work on your things. And so it meant that we were handling the, the objects more than usual to pack them up, move them off site, have them conserved and brought back. And also we were playing, paying an hourly rate. Uh, which you know, was more expensive for us. And so with our own uh, paintings conservation lab in place, uh, it meant that we could conserve a greater number of objects in a more cost efficient way. And it also allowed us um, maybe more hands-on um, uh, looking into the background of these works and exploring them more deeply than we could if they were located off site. Now before you here was one of the first works that was conserved after I arrived and that being Otis Dozier's iconic cotton bowl of 1936. And essentially, uh, the before and afters here, uh, the main issue here was flaking paint uh, in some various areas on the before, uh, some slight cracking, but also it was just a yellow varnish. And you can see the difference between the two. Yellow varnish, what it does is, is if you're holding a yellow filter up to your eye, looking through it, uh, the tendency is basically it extracts reds from the palette, or reduces the reds. And so, <clears throat> this is my morning voice, um, it's still not warmed up yet, but, um, <laughs> but extracts reds from the palette, and so essentially reds become orangey, um, blues become, you know, you see the blues up here, they become more greener because it's pulling the red out. And the other impact of uh, yellow varnish is that it affects depth procession within a painting. And so the forms do not relate properly to one another as the artist intended, and so it throws off how we read a painting. And so this was definitely a more uh, successful, you know, uh, transition here in the reading of the painting, but also the wonderful colors of this really great uh, painting which shows the plant in every stage of its uh, development. But when we look at things like this, it also allows us to look at other information. And this takes us to the back of, eh, come on, let's do this. Uh, and here we are on the back and it's, it's written in graphite, but can you see it upper left, it says cotton. Now he doesn't say cotton bowl, he says cotton and also not for sale. He hung on to this. He hung on to this for a very long time. Um, you know, we didn't acquire it until in about 1990 or so um, as a uh, gift purchase um, by a museum supporter. But this tells us, you know, there, there's something else behind that. But then as I was, you know, the longer I've been here, and the more per private collections I've visited, you know, I keep stumbling across things that I'm sure they're related specifically to our painting. So here we are. On the left, we have a, a work from our private collection in Dallas, which is, as you will note down here, cotton. And these are just separate teeny little studies that are concentrating on the flower and you know, the budding um, cotton and also you know, coming out. And so we see him working at this early stage, and I think this is probably related to the, the painting that we have at the DMA. But then, of course, the Dozier estate has this fully, full-blown, worked up, uh, the drawing, preparatory drawing for our painting, and the only difference between that and our painting is that he tames down these uh, elements here, so they're not quite so flaring out, not so prominent. But another thing that I was really um, pleased to find was, uh, next slide please, is uh, this other work in another private collection in Dallas, which shows Dozier's preliminary sketch. This is one of two sketches that he did for a cotton mural, which was never realized. And, uh, but as you can see, smack dab in the middle is that really great cotton plant motif uh, in all of its various stages. And it's basically almost exactly like in the lower half that he flipped this element the other way in the painting. So there's a close relationship here. And we know that he did you know, several murals. And uh, there, were two there was one for which he submitted some cotton studies, but the, it was not the winning sort of um, uh, uh, prospectus that he presented, and so it was never realized. And there's possibly another one. Um, these two projects could be either 1939 or 
41, but I was caught into this sort of chicken and egg thing, which came first, our painting or the murals or the murals or the painting, and that hasn't really been sorted out yet. He could have done these around the same time and presented them later. You know, I have this great stuff already worked up and he could have presented it later. So it's not really sure at what point, you know, his, his mural studies really were created, but there is definite relationship between them. And I feel this, uh, I feel a little dossier exhibition welling up inside here. You know, it just needs some more exploration. And then this leads us to another work uh, by William Huddle. Um, some of the Dallas sites here in the crowd, you know, will be maybe familiar with some of these things. Uh, but this was featured in a small conservation exhibition called Behind the Scenes at the DMA. And uh, what we have is a work that was given to us by the Hoblet Cell Foundation, uh, Treaty Oak, circa 1889. And its main issue was uh, essentially um, the um, yellow varnish. Because the condition essentially was pretty good, but the varnish, and, and this is a ultraviolet photography, which uh, essentially shows up yellowed varnish or in painting. And uh, in painting isn't really an issue here, but you can see the varnish. And we can also figure that in some ways it was probably laid on while it was still in the frame, uh, given some of the light pieces around the edges here. Uh, but we were able to, um, we were able to remove that. And then you can see the difference again, once the yellow varnish is removed, the greens become greener. The green blues become bluer, uh, and uh, the sky, of course, clearer. Uh, and again, it restores the depth procession uh, within the painting. But there was this other aspect, again, on the back. There's always such great information on the back of paintings or on the back of frames, old exhibition labels or whatever. But on the back of this particular work was this inscription in white in an unknown hand, tree under which Houston lay after a battle of San Jacinto original sketch for Tree in the Surrender of Santa Ana by W.H. Huddle. And then in the corner, you see um, the, uh, these blocks put on, which were put there um, years later to reinforce the corners, only to protect the corners. But someone put down here 1889, and whoever registered this in the collection said, oh, it was done 1889, and uh, not knowing who had put that there, even though it was done much later. Now. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. And all you guys knew your Texas art, and I'm a transplant, but I, even I knew something just didn't seem right here. Something wasn't adding up. Why do you have a, a painting called Treaty Oak, but the back you have the description saying it's a study, the sketch for uh, the uh, surrender of Santa Ana. So I had to go do some research to bone up on Texas history. And, um, and so I thought, well, okay, if it's a sketch for, let's see what this painting by Huddle looks like. And, and of course, there's the painting of the Surrender of Santa Ana, 1886. And it's obvious there that our tree is it's basically an absolute one-off copy with some editing done. He had to trim back some of these branches, clear it up so he can make space, made the tree maybe a little taller too, to make space for all of the characters spread across uh, the painting here. But he also extended a little bit to, uh, adapted a little bit to the rectangular format. And so this is definitely was related to the two, but then again, the disjunct between um, the treaty oak, which was, we know, I now know, <laughs> was the treaty signed in Austin by you know, uh, Stephen Austin with the native tribes in the 1830s. And then under another tree, but down in the Houston area, uh, was Sam uh, Houston you know, receiving the surrender of Santa Ana. And so, so what was the problem here? The question became, how did these two titles become confused? Um, was it a situation of someone just conflated them, didn't know their Texas history? That didn't seem likely to me. Or was it someone thought, well, it would be more valuable, this little painting would be more valuable as a painting of the treaty, the treaty oak, the legendary, the incredible treaty oak, rather than some anonymous tree under which you know, the, the surrender of Santa Ana took place. And that is something that one will never know, but essentially what it has led to, next slide please, is that I changed the title back to what it should be. And the fact that I now know that also the commission from the state legislature came in 1885. And so it's most likely this was done in 1885 and it's assumed it was probably done um, in land uh, you know, close by to where Huddle was living in the Austin area. And so that was sort of a neat new little discovery, sort of cleaning up some details that 
uh, had never really been cleared up before. And then this brings us to another work that most of you haven't seen, um, maybe in a reproduction, but not for many years. When I arrived at the DMA, I found this in a drawer in a cabinet because it had issues with paint losses and paint lifting. Uh, of course, crackler in the, um, the shrubs in the midsection here, and also shrinkage. See that white outline there? And so it had these, all these things going on, but the paint loss was particularly concerning because we could not hang it on the painting racks and fear that the vibrations of the painting racks, more paint would pop off. And so it was just laying flat and inert until we could figure out what to do about it. And again, this sort of treatment would have been very expensive, sort of, sort of thing we wouldn't want to farm out for cost um, uh, issues. And so now with the Paintings Conservation Lab, we can put these things forward uh, in the queue for uh, conservation. And I wanted to show you something else. The surface to me was very interesting, this painting. I've seen some lusters that are really saturated you know, uh, colors with varnish. And this has a very dry surface. And, but one thing I really liked about this, and you're gonna have to really screw up your eyes here and look closely, but along the whole top third of the painting, there's a blush. There's a blush that happens in the top section of the sky along here. And all these little dots, there's dots of rosy colored paint. And it became uh, apparent that um, Lester probably loaded up the tip of a large brush and then raked something across it and the splatter went across the top of the painting to create this really wonderful blush at the top of the sky. Um, but he took care to mask the areas of the rock here and the trees so none of that splatter got onto those elements. Um, and there just seemed to be in general experimentation going on with the painting. Next slide please. And maybe this is one reason why because he hung on to it for a while. There's nothing like an artist with, who doesn't know when to stop sometimes, you know, and they just keep mucking about and, you know, and making little adjustments, you know. And uh, it's, 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 it's epic. It goes on throughout you know, history. You know, Degas was really particularly guilty of it. You know, um, a friend once took a painting away from him because he's like, you know, it's perfect the way it is. Stop, stop, you know. And so artists you know, do this sort of thing. And so we know that Lester had it for a while, and therefore he could you know, monkey with it you know, as the mood or, or you know, inspiration struck him. And this is an ultraviolet photography, which really shows in greater degree some of the shrinkage that was taking place. You know, and also the cracking here, and this is close up in ultraviolet, gives you a, a greater sense of the crack allure that was happening here. He'd come back in and added more paint in here. And sometimes when you have two different paint layers, layers the, the types of pigments dry at different rates. And it can cause, if the, the under layer is drying at a different rate at the top layer, it causes a separation, islands of paint, and crackler, or sometimes it's called alligator crackle or whatever. And so that was something that was happening there, and that's, um, it was visually disturbing. And the other thing that was visually disturbing was the white outlines around the bush, uh, bushes because there had been some shrinkage as well uh, of the pigments he was using. And so those were issues that I want to resolve wanted to resolve, and um, here we are post-treatment where essentially the uh, white out outlines obviously are um, basically knocked back. What a conservator does, we use watercolors, which are entirely reversible. Um, first, you know, after the painting is clean, then we varnish it uh, to isolate the original paint layers, and then we come in with the watercolor and tap in little dots to knock back those visual interferences. So it doesn't really interfere with how you engage with the picture. Your eye isn't going to go to the white line, out, white outlines the first thing, nor is it going to go to the cracking in the bushes anymore because now those have been knocked back in a sim similar manner. And so it is my hope to soon to get this back on view because I would like just to do a nice display of surrealistic uh, Dallas Nine uh, landscapes in Texas. And this would be one that would fit the bill really nicely. And this brings us to a, a more recent project, and as you can see, pretreatment uh, analysis is basket case at the top. Uh, this work by Julian Onderdonk, Road to the Hills, uh, really beautiful work done essentially in, in the hill country, but a really wonderful what should be a white caliche type of road and a bright midday sun was rather reduced. It was dirty, but it also had been through a horrific conservation treatment in the 1950s. The work came in in 1919, um, a gift of the Shakespeare Club in honor of uh, Elizabeth Keast, uh, who had recently passed away. And, but with, back in those days, there were no climate controls, and essentially, um, 
the, uh, with the expansion and contraction, some cracking was taking place. In the 50s, it was decided to do something really pretty amazing uh, and quite frightful. Putting facing on the front of it, the material facing in the front, you lay it down its back, and they took a scalpel and shaved the canvas away from the ground layer and the pigment, slowly shaving it off, and then put galls on the back of it, and then glued it onto a piece of masonite. And you see that masonite here, tough and stiff, you know, and now it's glued down for time immemorial, uh, but it really uh, compromised the paint layers to a great degree and really didn't make it exhibitable. exhibitable. And here is a very a close up of uh, some areas in the foreground. You can see the cacti, it's there with these big white losses, these, these chunks out of it and little bits and pieces here. And then the pretreatment ultraviolet photography, which really shows us just how serious the situation was. Of course, it's going to be greatest at the edges. The losses were greatest at the edges where they started the, the process of peeling back and away. But they obviously lost some bits and pieces along the way. And these really dark, dark spots are in painting, uh, old um, pigment that was you know, introduced to in paint uh, the losses within the painting. But it, it looks like the thing has pox, you know, measles or something like this. It was really very serious. And so we embarked on a treatment which was much more moderate, but it was basically uh, going to be gluing down the lifting pieces and cleaning it and then uh, isolating it with a varnish layer and starting to end paint. There's the before with yellow varnish and all of its sort of um, dark spots of discolored overpaint in some areas. And now we've got this really much brighter presentation and we're not even finished yet. It'll probably be finished within the next month or two. Um, but we still have some work to do in the sky, but it has really brought back this really wonderful painting to me, which really shows that greater range of Onderdonk's work that steps outside of the blue bonnet theme. Uh, I know this was a painting that William uh, Rudolph wanted for the Onderdonk show, but the DMA did not have the money in 2008 to conserve it. And so again, another advantage of having our own in-house conservation lab and this gives you a, a look at it in the paintings conservation lab alongside the frame in which has been housed for many years. And then finally set within that frame. Uh, there's a, one quandary with this painting that I'm still having to work out is we, we don't know that this is really the original frame. Uh, and we were thinking so for a while, but this piece right here is a liner. It's not, um, it was added much later. The, you can tell the age of the wood is much newer than this older frame here. And so we're thinking that this may not be the original frame. And so either we just show it as is, or I decide to have the frame cut down and take the liner out, liner out, remove that liner, and then have the frame cut down to fit it. Or I go do some more research to find a more suitable frame as to what Andrak would be using with these hill country, white, blinding, midday light sort of things at that period of time around 1918. And then this takes us you know, to the next thing of sharing the legacy in exhibitions. And over the years, DMA has supported many exhibitions of Texas art. I think we know that the watershed moment uh, for early Texas art, but particularly regionalism in Texas, was Rick Stewart's really groundbreaking exhibition on Lone Star regionalism. It is the foundation on which so many um, uh, historians of Texas art have followed. They've stood on his shoulders and um, bringing it up to present day, even with Katie Edwards' recent, most recent book on mid-century modern art and placing it within its larger context. And so this is a, a long tradition. And for the, the museum, it's, it's also daunting to follow in the wake of uh, Rick Stewart and what he accomplished uh, for the DMA at that period and for Texas art uh, in particular. Um, we have gone on to do many you know, smaller and some larger shows since that day, but still he stands, it reigns supreme. Since I've arrived at 2011, there, I've taken part or worked on several um, projects uh, for Texas art, and um, I'll just show you a few of those. Uh, and the spring of 2012 was Texas in the 20s. This was an exhibition that was designed by us to dovetail with Youth and Beauty, um, Art of the American 20s, that was going on up in the Barrel Vault of Quads. And so we brought together this um, grouping of three artists, and you see on the main central uh, pier wall there a really wonderful arrangement of Mary Bonner's uh, cowboy uh, studies. And on the surrounding walls in that inner gallery were um, 
a, basically a nine pair set, 18 objects total, of Ello Griffiths, Griffiths preparatory studies and the etchings he made from them of areas around Dallas in around 1926. And in the outer gallery were some really great 1920s photographs by Eugene Goldbeck. And here's an up close of the Bonner Wall, which I really love. And then of course spring 2013 was Lauren Mosley's Structural Integrity. Um, I pulled this small exhibition together from the much larger one that Judy Deaton did out in Abilene. Um, she did a really fantastic job and had a really uh, much larger gallery space to deal with than I, I had at the DMA. So I went out there and had to basically select the things that I felt that might most uh, successfully tell very briefly in the number of 21 works uh, a sense of the idea of the range of Mosley's career at that time. And uh, I think it was fairly successful in that sense, but it's been one of my favorite exhibitions in terms of it, it had this jewel-like this jewel box sort of uh, aspect to it. Uh, the uh, wall colors, this wonderful green, really tapped into many of the, the uh, main sort of things with uh, those works that were in browns um, and oranges. And this comes out very clear in the inner gallery where you see all these wonderful oranges juxtaposed on that green wall, but then the wonderful brilliant blues um, and softer colors on that really wonderful deep red uh, brown, it just made them really look like these little jewels on the wall. And again, another view on the other side. And this brings us to Alexander Hoag, the Erosion Series last spring, um, 2014. This is the cover of the exhibition. Uh, a uh, catalog that we created at the DMA, especially for this uh, small focus show. Um, I'd like, I'm very proud, proud to say that this exhibition catalog was awarded one of three gold awards by the Texas Museum Association for e Exhibition Catalog Design. Um, that just came, we were just notified about that about a uh, month ago. And so that's something really wonderful. But the erosion series really presented the presented us with some several opportunities, one of those being the first time ever that the Erosion Series has been shown uh, together, all together. Uh, we were missing one painting, a key painting, sadly, but everything else was there. And it also allowed us the opportunity to bring forward something, though it happened in the 1930s, had so much to say, was so relevant today for what's happening in terms of um, water conservation, issues with climate, et cetera. And so we saw it also as a teachable moment uh, using his work from the 1930s. And third, it also provided us with an opportunity to basically rewrite the story about one of Hoag's most important paintings from the series, his Drouth's Survivors. And as we see an opening gallery here, starting off, uh, you know, very modest here. And I had to put this in because of the, the work to the far, far right is uh, Hoag's uh, 1938 Road to Rome. And um, this was a proud moment for me because that painting had not been seen in exhibition since 1984 at Hoag's retrospective at the Philbrook. And uh, it had been uh, repeatedly, uh, the owners since then had refused to lend it. And so this was the first time it had been seen in public in, you know, what, was it 40 years? And uh, 30 years, excuse me. And so essentially that was a really proud moment. And I had to practically crawl on my knees all the way to Santa Monica, California to get that thing there. And so I was like, it was, you don't know what I went through. But anyway, so got it here, which was really exciting. And, um, and it's even more exciting to find that it was decided, um, the owners decided to sell it and it, it was acquired by Dallas Collector. And so it's now back in Texas where it belongs. Um, that was another really great outcome from this. Um, another small wall, um, the Smithsonian's <laughs> Dust Bowl to the far right, and a great Mother Earth laid bare with the, uh, his uh, early studies for it, which some of them predated the painting by 10 years. And a look back, uh, the DMA's drought stricken area to the far left and the supporting works to its immediate right. And then the education section where we had um, films from the um, movie tone newsreels shot in Dalhart, Texas in, in 1935. And over here, interviews with farmers in the 60s who had grown up in Dalhart during the whole thing, uh, talking about the experience. Um, and maps about water, um, land, and the, um, the, um, uh, the reservoirs, um, particularly the, uh, I'm, 
again, it's too early in the morning for me, but the Ogallala, there we are, Ogallala Aquifer, uh, the shrinking Ogallala Aquifer. And then finally, this feed from the Texas Water Commission Board, in which they had asked people around the state to send in photos of what drought looked like in their part of the state. And it was strikingly similar, dead cows, you know, cracked earth, sand dunes, dust storms, uh, the whole thing. And it was sort of, I think, uh, really made people just sort of pull up short and think, wow, this, you know, the Dust, Bowls was, Dust Bowl was not an isolated incident. And I think it, we wanted to engender discussion about these things and make people think about this is more about turning the tap off when you're brushing your teeth, folks. You know, it's a bigger issue. We need to really be thinking about how we use our resources. And the next, uh, and finally, really, the, to me, I think the main uh, centerpiece of this exhibition was about um, a, the great painting that uh, Hogue did, Drought Survivors, and the two versions that came about and how they came about. And, um, and it basically was twice reborn, and I call it the Phoenix Reborn from the Ashes, twice. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, most of you probably know, next slide was the Drought Survivors, which he did in 1936. Um, and it was essentially um, a painting that had quite the history. Uh, it was uh, shown, well, first it was covered by Life magazine. And we see there the Life magazine spread in 1937. The magazine was only seven months old. And here we see Drought Survivors, sadly, in black and white, the lower right. The DMA's Drought Stricken Area, lower left. And Smithsonian's Dust Bowl up here. And of course, his self-portrait there, neighbors and um, Halting Neighbor. And uh, so this made him quite famous and infamous. And it really upset a lot of people in Texas. They saw him as a traitor for highlighting the Dust Bowl in Texas. The Chamber of Commerce was really upset in particular. But that same summer was the Pan American Exhibition, 1937, at the DMFA. And because of the exposure in Life magazine, everyone rushed to see this work. But further, the folks out in the Panhandle around the Amarillo area they decided we can't have this. They took up a collection and a $50, which is Boku bucks in 1936 during the Depression. Uh, but they came to Dallas determined to buy this painting so they could take it home and burn it, you know, as a symbol. And, uh, but he had a price tag of 2,000 bucks. So they went home empty handed. But nonetheless, you know, he was having to defend himself in the press, you know, in the editorials of the Dallas Morning News, um, because people were just saying, you know, he's a traitor, he's done us a disservice, et cetera. And he was saying, you know, I wasn't trying to do any of these things. I'm just saying, people, you have to wake up. Uh, and the situation we're in is your fault, all of our faults, for, you know, mismanaging uh, how we handle crops, agriculture, water, all these sort of things. And so it was, it, he wasn't a very popular guy. However, in 1938, you know, the French proved that he was quite popular with them. He sent it to an exhibition in, uh, in uh, Paris at the Jeux de Pomme, uh, Three Centuries of American Art. And there were only three contemporary works in the whole exhibition, his being one of them. The French saw his as the most American work there, and they purchased it. It was the only work purchased from that exhibition by the French government. And so that was really quite the coup, the feather in his cap. And we see here the exhibition catalog, um, which came to us um, uh, thanks to uh, George Palmer, actually. It's now in the collection. Because um, it features this, but also another work that is in the collection. And uh, so he was quite happy about this. And so basically the painting, uh, um, after being shown at the Tate just after the war in 1946, returned to Paris and was stored in a warehouse out Paris, outside Paris at Pantin. And um, a few months later, in, in uh, May, it burned. There was a fire. And it took the French of the 40s 11 months to find Hogue in April of 48 to let him know that his painting had been destroyed. And he was really quite distraught and tried to get to the bottom of it to see if there was anything that could be salvageable. Could he do something? He would even repaint it, you know, do a new version, whatever. But no, no, sadly, it's gone. Well, essentially, they had already been paid out an insurance payment. And so they couldn't resurrect a painting they'd been paid an insurance payment for. So uh, that, to me, I think is a real reason uh, that he, they couldn't fess up. But uh, so here was this really great painting. And it was lost to him and to his legacy. And it was a story that essentially Hogue would continue to tell for the rest of his life. And it was off repeated. It, was, it had been repeated right up through till 2011 in publications that this painting was lost and gone forever. 
Now for me, you know, I work, my colleague and my boss is Olivier Mollet, who was, you know, he's French and he worked in the French Museum system. And he said, no, it still exists. It's still, you know, it's still in France. You know, it's still being shown and, and it's uh, housed at the museum at Blancourt. And so, oh, this is really interesting. And so we thought we'll dig deeper into this. And so it was essentially um, through that that I got hold of the conservation files and the object files and had the chance to reconstruct the story about how this painting was thought to be destroyed on one side of the Atlantic, but on the other side it still existed. So what was the timeline for that? So the painting destroyed supposedly in 47, and it's not until, but the thing kept, kept hanging on the racks in storage in its damaged state for essentially you know, until 1971, when a young new curator by the name of Jean-Hubert Martin, who we see in his office there at the uh, Museum of, uh, National Museum of Modern Art, uh, we see him standing there to the left on, on the phone, and in the background we see Hogue's Oil in the Sand Hills. That's the painting that Hogue gave to replace drought survivors, okay? They still hadn't fessed up when he gave that to them in 61, okay? And so, but Jean-Hubert Martin, he was new, he's going through storage, he sees this painting hanging on the racks, and he thinks, this is the only, the sole example in the French collections of essentially art, real, American realism, but also social commentary between the wars. He saw this sort of surrealistic aspect to it as well, and he felt, we need to see if this can be saved, and so he sent to conservation. And conservation as a science has been evolving over time. You know, that's why conservationists try to do things that are reversible, because they know in five years or 10 years, there'll be new conservation techniques that'll resolve the issues that they couldn't fully resolve when they, with what they had available at that time. And so it went uh, for um, inspection. Next slide. And here is what the, the uh, photography from January 1973 shows. And we see how the extreme heat at the fire basically just sort of shrunk the painting, pulled it in at the edges, all the tacking margins around the edge. You can see how it's pulling against the tacking. The, the painting just dished out, uh, sunk in. And also there were more severe burns up along this edge, but particularly in this area up here that need to be addressed. There would be two stages of conservation, one of it which would essentially re-adhere the lifting pieces, and then it would be flattening the work out, lining it, getting onto new stretcher support before they could address the, um, the cosmetic issues of, uh, of in-painting the losses where the burns had taken place. But in 1974, they did all that. They completed it. They put the varnish on, and it entered into back into the collection. And this is where the story bifurcated because this painting became reborn. But the problem is, no one ever told Hogue that it had been done. So he labored on another 10 years, mourning this painting's loss, which was now restored. Uh, and he decided before the Philbrook Show in 1984 to make a new version, a second version of this. And at lower left, we see the work, uh, which is Linda and William Reeves' collection, the second version that was done in 1984. But all he had to work with was a black and white photo from Life magazine. And, uh, but he said, I remember the colors exactly. And, but this is how he had to work this. And you can see how closely how he, he got it right. You know, it's so close. There's some little minor adjustments. But even though he said he got the, you know, he remembered the colors exactly, by the 80s, Hogue was doing something completely new. He was moving into, he's back in the landscape. He'd been away from it for a couple decades. He's back to landscape, but now he's working on a much higher key um, type of palette. You know, he's working out in the Big Bend area now and doing these really great works in Big Bend, and his palette is completely adjusted. And so it was different, but you know, who was going to know because there'd never been a color reproduction of the original, okay? So who was to know? But at the same time, he as an artist had every right to show his work as it was in this time of his life. And so here we had now the two drought survivors on either side of the Atlantic Ocean. But sadly, Hogue went to his grave not ever knowing in 1994. He went to his grave not knowing that 20 years before the original had actually been restored. And then there were those who still doubted the existence of the, uh, of the original because it could not be at the exhibition because it had already been promised to an exhibition at the Pompidou. 
And so I went over to the Pompidou in uh, December of 2013 and met with the curator uh, Didier Schulman and I also was able to meet with Jean-Hubert Martin, it looks a little different now, uh, who actually saved drought survivors from uh, obscurity. And then this comes to expanding the legacy, new acquisitions. Uh, and uh, we're in a very enviable spot because we have this, we've built this great collection over the years through the aid of you know, purchase prizes, Bywater's, um, you know, his guiding hand, many years he was a director or involved even before that at the DMA, and then the subsequent uh, gift of the Barrett collection in the 1990s. So we were pretty well situated, but there's still areas in which we have some holes to fill and one that I want to address in particular are works on paper. Um, we have uh, many of the Dallas Nine in particular were really great draftsmen, great printmakers, and we have plenty of lithographs and etchings, et cetera, but in several of them we are really lacking drawings, works, you know, the, the, um, the initial thought processes in, in many of these things. And so it's really great to see you know, to acquire these sort of things so you can see the artist's first thought of how he's working things out. It's such an immediate sort of thing, um, you know, uh, with pen to paper or watercolor in particular to paper because watercolor is so unforgiving. And so um, Everett Spruce is one of those artists we did not have a single drawing or a watercolor by. And so we've acquired the Smallberry River. I think it's you know, 1930, maybe a little bit afterwards, but what I really liked about this watercolor was it has that central massing in the center that was such a key motif to so many of his works, his landscape works of the 1930s, and so I feel like this really addresses something very important within his early work. And we acquired three drawings uh, by Spruce. They're undated, but I show you here two here, but what I love about them, the simplicity, even though it's a single line drawing, um, the simplicity of it, but you can see within the lines the energy, that activity that you see in so many of his later paintings, um, the, the, the sort of the nervous energy, and it comes through, forth in the lines here that he puts uh, simply uh, onto paper here with you know, graphite. And then a great gift at the end of uh, this past year from Barbara Delabano, uh, the wife of the late Barney Delabano, uh, and he had uh, she gave us uh, several works by Charles Bowling, by her late husband Barney, Otis Dozier, and Barbara Maples. And I looked for things that you know address you know lacuna again within our uh, our uh, collection. The one I was particularly excited was uh, about was the study for industrial encroachment. We had the print, but we did not have the preparatory drawing. And I find these things so very interesting because to me this is how we see how an artist works things out. When you have the, the sort of the, the initial thought and the final product, you really get a chance to see how the artist was thinking things out. You're crawling behind their eyes, you're in their head, and you're seeing how they're working things out. And so I've taken the liberty of flipping the drawing so you can see how it pairs up. And then you basically notice how he addressed several things um, by essentially, well, creating um, a sense of um, menace he increases the menace of the industrial encroachment by increasing the height and the mass of the building. Um, he also had to essentially um, uh, widen, well, shorten the, the composition a little bit to the square format so things come a little bit closer. But also he adjusted the height of all of these uh, structures within it to create a very much better sense of rhythm. So you're climbing up and down and up and down and round. And so all these things, he's creating better rhythm. He's creating greater decorative elements to carry you around the composition. And so you see how he's working things out from the beginning to the end. And this is the moment where I take this sort of, um, I'm gonna take advantage of my uh, having the mic, well actually two mics, um, uh, and saying that if any of you out there own anything related to any work by the DMA, we want it. So don't, don't go selling it somewhere, you know, just send it to us, you know, you can get tax write-offs and things like that. So um, we do want it because it's really important to have works like this together, because it really brings across the point of how this artist was working. And, um, and this goes for, if you have preparatories for prints we have, or for paintings we have, I want to hear from you, so. And this other great thing I had to put on, because it's one of my favorite things, but uh, Charles Bowling's Desolation. Now, um, I just laughed, I, this thing just tickled me, and Barbara just said, okay, you can have that one, because you like it so much. Uh, but essentially, she told me the story about how 
Barney would go over to Charles Bowling uh, place uh, with sort of mentor mentee sort of relationship and how he would run off new prints and just hand them straight into the hands of Barney. And so he had all these really great things by Bowling and, and I saw this and I thought, I've never seen anything like this by him before. It seems a bit of a departure from his, some of his subject matter. And, and the thing I thought, I wonder if it's a one-off. And what I'm here putting to you, you're helping me out here. It's like, has anyone ever seen this before? Or do, does anyone own a print of this before? I don't know if it's a one-off. I mean, there's part of me that wants to believe it is, of course, you know, being a unique print. Um, but, and I thought, well, if it is a one-off, why? Well, it has this weighty, ponderous title, desolation, you know? But then here it is, it's very humorous because the horse in the foreground, it looks like it died standing up. Rigor mortis, you know, set in before it ever heaved over onto the ground. And so it has this very comical aspect to it, uh, which to me makes it very charming. But I was also, you know, still deep in the throes of Alexander Hogan, the Erosion Series, and Dust Bowl in general, and this really appealed to me. Um, but I do think it's a one-off, but, you know, feel free to disabuse me of my, my delusions. Uh, if necessary, but uh, it may be unique. Uh, uh, this is Ray Pleasant, uh, Research Associate for Early Texas Art. Uh, last summer, I received a challenge grant from a collector in Austin, basically to help with the raising of money or funds to help support a position uh, of a research associate to help me out to accomplish a few things. And um, I was really overwhelmed by the response. There are many of you sitting here in this auditorium who helped contribute to the success of that fundraising venture. And also, um, uh, Cassetta itself uh, was also a contributor, which I thank you very much for. And uh, it was resoundingly successful to the point that I really have enough for two back-to-back uh, -back terms uh, for the position. And uh, it has been really uh, very helpful to me. Because since Ray has arrived here, um, just before Thanksgiving, a few days before Thanksgiving she started, she has surveyed the early Texas artworks on paper collection, um, with the point was to determine all the duplicate prints to be considered for deaccession. We're keeping the good ones, the best ones, sorry, but, uh, <laughs> but, but determining ones that could be you know, deaccessioned uh, so we could raise funds for other acquisitions. Uh, also to ascertain which works require matting and the estimated cost for that. Uh, which we'll probably be looking for money for. So, you know, if you want to get in on it, you know, just let me know. <laughs> and then uh, she also assessed the condition for removal of old adhesives and repair of tears, et cetera. And we're uh, working on costing that out. And uh, also surveyed our holdings of prints and the original matrices or the blocks uh, by Janet Turner, because we have a really great uh, thing together. And uh, hopefully down the road, we can put together a small show about that. And she also took a printmaking course at SMU to better understand this. So I felt that was really proactive on her part. And she has since compiled a list of works needing digi digitization for the collection database and the website. She's developed a spreadsheet that is um, basically tracking the factual errors between the website and the collection database uh, so we can correct those. And she's written blog posts for the DMA's website, DMA Uncreated, provided two uh, Texas art spots for inclusion and taco newsletters. And she's presented gallery talks on various works of early Texas art and plans on entry on the Texas folk artist Willard Watson for the Texas State Historical Association. And the early Texas art gallery talk, she did one on Ledbetter, uh, Michael Owen's um, sculptural portrait of uh, Ledbetter, the great jazz musician, and she went down the rabbit hole on that one. So this weekend she's in Washington, D.C. attending the tribute concert for Ledbetter. So, uh, Leadbelly, excuse me, Leadbelly. And so she's in Washington doing Leadbelly this, this weekend. And, and I'm uh, also happy to say that she and I will be working together on a project to produce a book on Texas art at the DMA. It will be a selection of the, the highlights cutting across painting, sculpture, and works on paper um, that will give people an idea of the richness of the collection. And uh, also, I'm happy to say that one collector here has stepped forward to help assist with that and um, to lend his, his support by underwriting that project. And so those are some really the great things ahead. And this, these sort of collaborations, whether it's for the research associate, whether it is for um, these future projects, such as this book on early Texas art at the DMA, um, as well as uh, the gifts, the support for various things that have been lent along the way, it 
goes to reform and reinforce the idea that this legacy can only survive, can only be supported from both ends of the spectrum. There are the people such as myself at the DMA and many institutions like me who work to preserve, to, to share, and to expand this legacy, but in so many cases, and really in DMA's cases all the time, we really do so with the support and the active engagement of so many of you who believe so strongly in Texas art. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, thank you.